Hello, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning or good evening based on your time zone. Uh, welcome to the first uh, journal club, which is run by the um, Journal of Physiology, the Physiological Society. Um, so I'm, I'm very glad that I have this opportunity to host this uh, first uh, meeting. So my name is Bahman Nasr al Islami, so from Trinity College, Dublin. And um, so, uh, so we have the pleasure of uh, having a panel of um, uh, researchers here that we together discuss the paper today. So before um, starting the meeting, so I would like to remind you that the session will be recorded uh, so that, um, so be aware of that. And this will be shared later on with the audience. Um, and um, so you can submit, uh, any questions you might have through the Q&A uh, button in, in Zoom. So, uh, and then when it comes to Q&A um, section, so we will discuss the questions. Thanks very much. So we start um, today's um, meeting. So um, here is a summary of what we are going to do. So we will have a quick introduction of the attendees and, um, and then we will have a short presentation of about 10 minutes uh, on the background of the topic and then a, a summary of the paper that we are going to discuss. And then later on, uh, so we um, discuss together with the panel members, um, different aspects of the paper and uh, research directions. And finally, we will have the question, uh, questions from the audience and the answers by the panelists. But uh, you can also submit your questions at any time. So, so, so let me introduce the attendees um, here. Um, so we have the authors of the paper. Um, and we have uh, Bradley DeForest, who is a research associate in the lab of Monica Perez at Shirley Ryan Ability Lab and a PhD student in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Miami. His training includes a master, uh, master's degree in exercise and sports sciences and biomedical engineering. So his research interests focus on non-pharmacological, non-invasive interventions for motor disorders and understanding the physiological mechanisms of these interventions. So, so the other author of the paper is Professor Monica Prez, a PT PhD, who is the scientific chair in the Arms and Hands Lab at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab in Chicago and a professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, Northwestern University. Um, her research interests uh, are in understanding how the brain and spinal cord contribute to the control of voluntary movements in healthy humans and in individuals with spinal cord injury. Uh, she uses this mechanis uh, mechanistic knowledge to develop rehabilitation therapies following CNS damage. So we also have the editors of the paper, um, Professor Richard Carson and uh, Dr. Uh, Christopher West. Um, Richard Carson is Chair in Cognitive Neuroscience of Aging in School of Psychology and Institute of Neuroscience at Trinity College Dublin. His research focuses upon uh, human brain plasticity across lifespan and development of methods to maintain and restore uh, cognitive and movement function in later life. Uh, this current clinical and preclinical uh, research has a specific emphasis upon the rehabilitation of stroke survivors, including the development and thera uh, of therapeutic evaluations of assistive devices. His expertise relates principally to the physiology of cognitive and motor systems and experience uh, with a variety of um, investigative approaches, including behavioral recording, non-invasive brain stimulation, brain imaging, and, and electrophysiology. Uh, Dr. Christopher West is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia. He leads a translational research, uh, um, research lab investigating the cardiorespiratory consequences of spinal cord injury. And um, so this has a focus specifically in the plasticity of neural circuitry and how um, it underpins the changes in functional uh, in function post injury. So we have Professor CJ Heckman, so uh, who is a professor in the Department of Physiology uh, at Northwestern University. 
uh, in Chicago, uh, United States. Um, Dr. Heckman's lab has worked on the mechanisms of spinal motor output for over 20 years. And this research has included uh, cellular, circuit, and system level techniques in animal preparations and computer simulations. So with an emphasis on developing new therapies for spinal injury, ALS, and cerebral stroke. So uh, thanks very much again for all of the attendees um, for accepting the invitation um, to join the meeting today. So I would like to um, ask uh, the authors of the paper and uh, Professor Heckman to uh, start a brief um, presentation on the background of the topic and uh, also a summary of the paper. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you to Bauman, Monica, and everybody for, and the journal for inviting me to give a brief introduction to this really fascinating paper. <clears throat> kind of the key thing that the, you, uh, is not widely appreciated is that <clears throat> all motor neurons are simply covered with synapses containing neuromodulatory inputs, particularly serotonin and norepinephrine from the brainstem. These neurotransmitters, of course, have lots of functions in the brain, but their effects on motor neurons are really strong. And you can see that on the right side of that slide here, in the green trace, you're providing a, a motor command, a synaptic input to depolarize a motor neuron. And uh, as long as uh, you don't have much in the way of serotonin and norepinephrine present, the, the EPSB just tracks the input and turns off when the input turns off. If, on the other hand, moderate levels of serotonin and norepinephrine are pre present due to tonic activity in the brainstem, which is what happens in the normal waking state, that same motor neuron starts firing, it has a much stronger response, and it keeps going. So this is what is relatively unappreciated about motor neurons, their base state, unless it's specifically controlled, is to turn on and stay on. Next slide. So, no, so normally, by a mechanism we don't fully understand, somehow inhibition is combined with motor commands that you naturally inhibit your motor neurons after you excite them in some way. So this uh, prolonged behavior does not occur. Now, in spinal cord injury, of course, you lose, or at least this damage is from uh, includes uh, axons, the axons of the brain stem, so the serotonin drive is reverse, but Dave Bennett and colleagues some years ago found this remarkable result that even, even though motor neurons are partially or totally deprived of their serotonin and norepinephrine, the receptors on the motor neurons uh, adapt plastically to this and simply turn themselves on. So the motor neuron returns to a state where it generates persistent inward currents even though serotonin input is reduced or lost. That is to say that the receptors become constitutively active. This is a whole interesting literature from Dave's, Dave's group, which I encourage you to look at, but it's a little peripheral to our, our situation today. In the figure here, you can see in B that just after spinal cord transection in an animal model, a stimulus goes to the motor neurons, and the motor neurons have lost their persistent occurrence because of loss of serotonin, and nothing much happens. About 30 days later in the rat, and probably a couple months in humans, the persistent inward currents have recovered, and that same sort of stimulus produces a prolonged output, in large part probably generated by these PICs, and this is one of the primary mechanisms of uncontrolled spasms. And they're spasms and they're uncontrolled because you don't have the, the volitional control of the inhibition that you normally have to bring them back to normal. And so uh, one of the great things about this paper is it asks the question, well, what if you can reactivate inhibition in spinal cord injury and help bring these persistent inward currents and spasms under control? And with that, I'll turn it to Monica. Okay, thanks, CJ. So spasms are involuntary muscle contractions that can last for from a few seconds to minutes. And approximately 80% of people who have a spinal cord injury experience spasms at some point. So uh, one of the ways for us to make inferences about the mechanisms that contribute to spasms in humans is by using electrophysiology and by testing the cutaneous reflex. So this is raw data showing you the cutaneous reflex 
in the tibialis anterior muscle in a patient who had a spinal cord injury. And this reflex was elicited by electrical stimulation of the medial plantar nerve. The first 500 milliseconds of the reflex are likely initiated by the prolonged polysynaptic excitatory postsynaptic potential that is triggered by a stimulation of cutaneous and muscle afferents. This long excitatory postsynaptic potential activates persistent inward currents, as CJ mentioned, and this uh, amplifies and prolongs the reflex response. So therefore, the long-lasting component of the cutaneous reflex is likely to be entirely mediated by persistent inward currents. This is also supported by data from the laboratories of David Bennett and Karim Fouad, who demonstrated in people with incomplete and complete spinal cord injuries that by using cyproheptadine, this is a medication that can block 5-HT receptors, they could abolish the long-lasting reflex. So therefore, medication have a series of side effects. So we ask with Bradley, how can we suppress the long-lasting reflex in humans with spinal cord injury by using a non-pharmacological approach? If you look at the literature, there has been a number of approaches that have shown some success in decreasing symptoms of spasticity, including muscle spasms in humans with spinal cord injury. These include repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, transcutaneous spinal stimulation, and whole body vibration. Even if you use a single session or multiple sessions, there are some positive effects, but the effects still are limited and short-lasting. Therefore, we decided to use a targeted approach. This is single tendon vibration to suppress activity in antagonistic motor neurons. Evidence has shown that vibration of a tendon can inhibit antagonistic motor neuron firing, generates inhibitory postsynaptic potentials in antagonistic motor neurons via the 1A inhibitory interneuron, and persistent inward currents can be modulated and also suppressed by reciprocal 1A inhibition. So we hypothesized that vibration of an agonist muscle tendon would attenuate the long-lasting component of the reflex, which is likely uh, indicative of the persistent inward currents in the antagonist muscle, likely via reciprocal inhibitory mechanisms. To test the uh, hypothesis, we had 25 people with spinal cord injury uh, participate in the study. Um, they had a wide range of injury levels from C2 to T11 with a range of injury completeness from motor complete to quite functional at age of D, uh, with a range of, of spasm frequency and severity, and about half of them were taking antispastic medications. Next slide. Uh, our methods to evaluate the vibration effects on the cutaneous reflex were we stimulated the mid arch of the foot uh, with a 14 pulse electrical strain um, and to evoke the reflex in tibialis anterior and soleus. We then vibrated either the tibialis anterior tendon or the soleus tendon with a one second vibration at 20, 40, 80, or 120 hertz, ending one second before stimulation, and then analyzed the mean rectified EMG amplitude of the long polysynaptic and long lasting uh, reflex components. Next slide. First looking at the vibration of the Achilles tendon on the reflex in TA and soleus, um, in the upper figure there, uh, this is an example from an individual spinal cord injury. Uh, in black is the reflex without vibration, and in red is the reflex with 80 hertz vibration. And as we can see here, there is quite a suppression in the long-lasting component in the antagonist TA. Uh, looking at the group data, we see that the long polysynaptic component of the reflex was unaffected in both muscles, whereas the long-lasting component was significantly reduced at 40 and 80 hertz vibration, 
with a stronger effect at 80 hertz vibration than 40. Next, we'll move on to looking at the effects of vibration of the tibialis anterior tendon. Here we see a very similar trend. Uh, we see that the long lasting component in Soleus, the antagonist here, is quite suppressed. Whereas in TA, uh, there does not look to be much of an effect. And the group data shows that, again, uh, the long polysynaptic component was unaffected, whereas the long lasting component was significantly suppressed at 40 and 80 hertz vibration again in Soleus only. Next, we looked at reciprocal inhibition and the effects of vibration on the inhibition. To do this, we had our participants who had voluntary dorsiflexion and plantar flexion at the ankle hold a 10% maximum isometric voluntary contraction uh, in one muscle, and we stimulated the antagonist nerve. Uh, here in the, on the right, we see an average of 100 trials um, of the rectified EMG. And at about 35, 30 to 35 millisecond latency, we see a nice area of inhibition there in the voluntary EMG. Go ahead and click, Monica. Um, and to, affect, uh, to look at the effects of vibration, we vibrated with 80 hertz vibration for a second, ending one and a half seconds before stimulation of the antagonist nerve, which coincided with the latency of the long lasting component of the reflex. And in red here, we see that we had an increase in both the amplitude and duration of the reciprocal inhibition with the vibration. Click. And looking at the group data, we can see that both in soleus and tibialis anterior, we had a significant increase in reciprocal inhibition when we vibrated the antagonist tendon. And this increase in inhibition was significantly strongly correlated with the reduction in the long lasting component in these individuals. So to conclude, uh, agonist tendon vibration attenuated the long lasting cutaneous reflex in the antagonist muscle with 80 Hertz as the most optimal frequency. Uh, reciprocal 1A inhibition between agonist and antagonist muscles uh, contributes to modulating the long-lasting component of the reflex, likely affecting the persistent inward currents. And finally, we argue that agonist-antagonist tendon vibration may be a way of targeting muscle spasms after spinal cord injury where we could vibrate the antagonist to whatever muscle is problematic in the individual. Thank you very much. We'll uh, turn this back over to Bauman. Yeah, thanks very much for, for the great uh, presentation. So, um, so, um, so again, so for uh, everyone who, uh, who recently joined the, the meeting, so I would like to uh, suggest to, uh, to use the Q&A function to submit any questions or comments you might have on the, on the papers, and then so we will uh, discuss that um, so uh, in about 10, 15 minutes. But now, so, um, so I'm specifically interested to pose a few questions uh, and then discuss the, the paper, but also the wider uh, research area in, in this, on this topic. Um, and I would like to start really by, um, by asking uh, Bradley and Monica um, a few questions. So, um, well, the results are really interesting for sure. Um, so, but probably so many audience would think, so how could you actually select and match the methods with your research questions? So how did you come up with the ideas? Say, for example, specific reflexes, frequencies, and um, so the relationship between uh, PIC and other pathways. So um, any, any thoughts on that? Brad, you want to start or should I start? <laughs> you, you can go ahead first. Okay, so, 
I think you know, one of the goals in, in our lab is to understand uh, how can we suppress symptoms of hyperexcitability in humans with spinal cord injury. We have done a little bit of work to understand spasticity, and more recently we started to understand muscle spasms. So if you look at the overall literature, uh, usually these symptoms are treated by using medications, which have a number of side effects, or they're using uh, the effects seems to be treated by other non-invasive approaches, such as neurostimulation, which are indirect approaches. So we look at the literature with uh, Bradley and we decided to use a more targeted approach because we have evidence that if you use vibration of you activate repeatedly afferent fibers, you can suppress reflex activity in the antagonistic muscle. So the best uh, way for us, the best methodology was the cutaneous reflex because we know that mechanistically, the later part of this reflex is actually involving persistent inward currents. Then when we observed that there was a suppression, the most logical question was what is the mechanism for that suppression? So based on CJ's uh, work, we know that one of the strong mechanisms that can suppress persistent inward currents is reciprocal inhibition. And we can test that mechanism in humans by using electrophysiology. So that is a little bit of the background and the rationale for the methods that we use. So I, I can add a little bit to, oh, um, uh, I can add a little to it. Um, so previous to joining Monica's lab, I worked with Christine Thomas at the Miami Project Cure Paralysis, and we characterized spasms after spinal cord injury. And this research really highlighted the need for alternative interventions, which were more targeted rather than general, um, for example, using baclofen, um, because we found that spasms in certain muscles appear to be more problematic than others. Uh, additionally, medications may have more generalized effects, which may reduce function uh, in spared muscles after injury. Um, so it's really important to come up with a more targeted approach to uh, controlling spasms. Um, Monica just mentioned that uh, the research uh, showed that vibration can use, uh, can generate IPSPs in the antagonist motor neurons uh, via 1A interneurons. Um, which really kind of came, helped with the idea of using vibration as, as a, an approach. Um, other previous research has shown that different frequencies of vibration uh, can preferentially uh, activate different receptors. So um, lower frequencies are, are more uh, Golgi tendon organ. Um, 40, 80, 80 hertz seems to be the opt optimal frequency for activating spindles, whereas higher fre frequencies may be activating more cutaneous uh, mechanoreceptors. Um, so that kind of contributed to where we came up with these frequencies. Um, and then my master's thesis in biomedical engineering involved development of the, this dev device that we use for the vibration, as well as some software to detect muscle spasms in real time. Um, so when I joined Monica's lab, the focus evolved to understanding the physiological circuitry that we could leverage to suppress the involuntary muscle activity. Yeah, thanks very much. So that was a very good um, summary of uh, how things emerged and happened. So uh, thanks very much. So uh, Bradley, so may I um, continue on what you mentioned and, uh, and ask uh, another question? So, um, so I was wondering what technical challenges uh, did you face during uh, conducting this study? and? So how did you overcome the challenges? What are the practicals of doing such a uh, type of research? Uh, and specifically, how that leads to limitations of this study, just like any other study? Yeah, so um, a few different uh, challenges that we uh, encountered, I, I, I came up with four that I thought were, were some major challenges. Uh, so the first one was, was designing the vibration to have the correct parameters for what we needed. Um, so in the literature, looking at vibration, uh, the frequency and duration is, is quite clear of what has been previously used, but the amplitudes are, are many times uh, not reported or unclear. Um, so some of it has to go back and, and looking at, look up the specifics of these motors and vibrators that are used previously, and then finding uh, 
motors that we can use to um, make our own device or, or, or figure out what device to use to, to get the proper um, parameters for the vibration. Um, some of that involved, you know, acquiring some of the motors that were used previously and, and using accelerometers to determine the actual parameters that they used. Um, and then once we knew the correct parameters, it was important to maintain those vibration parameters across the conditions. Um, so we used a accelerometer to monitor the accelerations during the vibration to make sure that it was not changing from trial to trial, um, as well as the amplitude was standardized across frequencies. Um, another part of standardizing these conditions was maintaining uh, the same amount of pressure between the vibration and the limb. Uh, we used one Newton um, and using a, a pressure sensor to maintain that we were keeping the same pressure between the leg and the vibration motor. Uh, the second um, challenge that uh, came up was standardization of uh, stimulation for cutaneous reflex. Um, so if you, if you go too low of a intensity, this reflex can be quite variable from trial to trial. Um, other studies have used a variety of intensities, um, anywhere between 15 and 100 milliamps, um, different lengths of pulse trains, five pulse trains up to 14. Um, and since a lot of our patients did not have any sensation, we couldn't uh, standardized based on sensory threshold. Um, and in addition to not having sensation, some of our patients had hypersensitivity in their feet. So we also did not want to go hot, so high that it was going to cause pain. Uh, so we decided to increase the intensity in, in 10 milliamp steps until there was no further increase in amplitude and duration with the increased intensity, that way we were we were sure that we were getting a, a much more reliable uh, reflex from trial to trial, so that we were sure that it was actually the vibration that was um, having an effect, not just the variability of the reflex itself. And then finally, uh, in the reciprocal inhibition um, experiment, we also wanted to make sure that we were standardizing the stimulation intensity so that we can compare between muscles um, so we normalized the stimulation intensity to motor threshold um, and also the level of voluntary contraction at 10% for both muscles. And then since we are uh, looking at this in people with spinal cord injury and it is well documented that inhibition is reduced, um, we had to use more stimulations than in a uh, uninjured person to be able to average the rectified EMG to see the inhibition. And we had to take much more frequent rest breaks um, so that we avoided fatigue. Yeah, thanks very much. So uh, that was a very thorough summary um, of all of the challenges you, you actually faced. Yeah, thanks very much for that. So. Um, so I, I see that the questions are coming. So please submit your uh, questions through uh, Q&A function in Zoom. So, and then we will um, try to answer them. So afterwards, so, but now, so uh, I would like to um, ask one of the editors, Dr. Christopher West, um, uh, a question about the position of the paper. Chris, so how do you consider um, the paper compared to the other papers in the field? How does the paper really stand out in terms of the methods used and in terms of the findings and the direction that the research community is going? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, this was, a, this was a really interesting paper when it came to me. Um, I'm a researcher in, in, in the field of spinal cord injury and I, I see people with spinal cord injury quite often in my lab. And, you know, it's, as you've heard, spasms are, are really common and they're common across um, people with different types and severities and um, time post injuries. The really big thing is that, you know, spasms, um, they really interfere with activities of daily living and they'll have a pretty significant impact on quality of life for people with spinal cord injury. Um, as you've heard from the presentation, there's been a, a quite a lot of research on this topic and um, we certainly now know that these cutaneous reflexes are amplified in the setting of spinal cord injury. 
but but research really hasn't been able to um i guess effectively solve this problem and so you know a few things that really stood out to me was that um this used a really astute methodological approach it, it had a, a targeted way of dealing with the problem of spasticity um, it also tested a mechanism of action and ultimately it, it, it really focuses on something that's of high clinical concern to, uh, to one of the uh, biggest clinical populations. And for those of you that don't know, you know, spinal cord injury is becoming ever more common as treatment gets better. There's now over 2.5 million people living with spinal cord injury. So this is a, this is a problem that affects a lot of people. Uh, and then finally, just uh, for those that don't work in the field of spinal cord injury, you know, this was actually 25 individuals, which, might not sound like a lot of people, but to, to recruit 25 individuals with spinal cord injury to a study such as this is, is actually quite a challenge. Um, most of the time in the field of spinal cord injury, you have to be quite focused on the, on the inclusion criteria with respect to injury level uh, and completeness of injury. Um, but with this topic, you're actually able to include quite a large sample with, with different representation from the injury groups. And so this makes it, it adds a few complexities with the study, but it, but it also makes it much more generalizable. Um, so yeah, that, that's some of the things that, that really stood out for me. And, and, and that's why we, we sent the paper out to re review where it was received positively. Yeah, thanks very much, Chris. That was a, a really good um, explanation of why um, the paper uh, had something specific. So, so it was also very uh, interesting for me myself. So, um, so, so may I uh, get back to uh, Monica and CJ uh, again? So, um, so in addition to, to, to the methods used in this paper, so what methods do you think um, are the most promising ones? Um, so when it comes to really targeting and really um, uh, studying specific circuits in the motor system. So uh, I, I know the discussion can take long, so and then we are uh, uh, running behind the schedule, but very briefly, if you have any thoughts, that would be really useful. So probably Monica, so if you want to. So, yes, Paman, thanks. So I, I think in humans right now, electrophysiology is one of the most powerful techniques that we have to target motor circuits. And I'm gonna give you an example from this paper. So what we learned is that through reciprocal inhibition, we could suppress to some extent uh, a cutaneous reflex, the later part, in a human with spinal cord injury, but those effects are still limited. I mean, if you think about, if you look at David's Bennett paper, they abolished the cutaneous reflex with the pharmacology. We only achieved 30, 20 to 30% of suppression of the reflex. So we still need to continue using physiology to understand how can we make this effect stronger. So what we're doing right now with Brad is to try to understand the contribution from descending motor pathways into the reciprocal inhibitory pathway. Uh, we know that reticulospinal, vestibulospinal pathways are having control over these interneurons. So our goal is to upregulate or downregulate the magnitude of reciprocal inhibition and use even a more hopefully targeted approach that is combined with vibration to enhance the effect. Yeah, thanks very much, Monica. So that was, um very um, to the point and useful. So CJ, any other thoughts um, So on, on the same question? I agree with Monica. And I think also just the uh, whole field of electrical stimulation, a lot of what happens when you put electrical stimulation on just on the dorsal surface of the back for the, or the spinal column probably is activating afferents and 1A afferents are the lowest threshold. So that's gonna potentially be a way of increasing reciprocal ambition. And also that our running hypothesis is that reciprocal inhibition is in fact the pathway you normally use to control PICs when the cord is intact. So anything you can do to improve it post-injury is a good idea. Yeah, thanks very much, CJ. So um, that's great. So, uh, so for, for, because we are running short, um, short of time, so I'm, I'm going to ask the latest question in panel discussion. So from, um, uh, uh, Professor Carson, the other editor of the paper. So, um, so, so just following up on, on this discussion, so how do we see changes in trend of the papers that are being submitted and published? So in terms of using these new methods, um, working towards more specific uh, assessment of motor circuits. So, so what's the current trend um, uh, in, in the 
papers and then what do you foresee for the for the future uh, richard so any thoughts would be really uh, useful well maybe i can speak not so much to current trends but perhaps what i would like to see is as future trends uh, perhaps inspired by this uh, this type of approach so as a number of panelists have emphasized and you know monica and brad uh, set out to undertake very much hypothesis driven research uh, that was informed both by work that had been uh, conducted using animal models and also by the clinical presentation and they used methodology uh, methodologies electrophysiological methods that were tied very closely to those hypotheses but i think there are also lessons that can be learned in terms of studying motor control in, as it were, non-damaged systems. And to echo some of the points that have been made, normal motor control depends uh, on a number of systems, number of descending systems and intrinsic properties of, of uh, spinal motor neurons. And I think perhaps in the last um, 20 years or so, uh, the field has become a little, can I say, corticospinal centric. Uh, perhaps as a consequence of the availability of certain techniques such as transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is, is relatively easy to use. But I think it's led to a rather narrow focus and perhaps um, we haven't given sufficient consideration to the important functional role of some of these other systems, descending systems, properties of uh, spinal motor neurons and so on. So if I were to identify a trend that I would like to see developing. It's on, it would be for more thoughtful and more comprehensive use of techniques that are, uh, I suppose, implemented with a goal of, of seeing motor control in a, in a broader uh, sense uh, and in a way that uh, reflects the diversity of the contributions from a, a number of these systems. Uh, thanks, Richard. So that was very insightful. So, um, so um, yeah, thanks very much for that. So uh, I think because we are not really ahead of schedule, so I, I think it is good to um, move on to um, questions asked by the uh, audience here. And uh, as I said, so you can continue to submit um, your questions. So the first question um, asks, uh, and, and then so I ask all of the panel members. So. You have used frequencies that are harmonics of 20 Hertz. Have you tried using the non-harmonic frequencies? So. Monica, can I uh, answer that? So. Uh, Go ahead, yeah. We've actually, so you, you do, motor neurons can have a tendency to respond to subharmonics of a, of a sinusoid, but <clears throat> some data that we haven't published yet shows that in humans, the conduction delay, especially from the ankle up to the spinal cord, is so long, and the, the differences in the conduction uh, velocities of the various even 1A afferents disperse the signal, and they, they seem to smooth out those, those, heart, those oscillations. And so you're driving the motor neuron pool actually with a signal that doesn't have very strong oscillations in it, but rather it's smooth, relatively smoothed out. So I, I don't think the harmonics will make a, a difference, but of course, different it's always a good idea to try different frequencies. Yeah, thanks very much. So any, any other um, answers? If, if not, so we can move to, to the next questions. Yeah, okay, so um, I, I read the question. So a really interesting presentation, thank you. Uh, one question I have is how realistic is it to transfer these fin findings over to those with back injuries where the spasms are actually in the back? I would imagine it would be quite difficult to identify the specific muscle that is uh, in spasm in the back. And so it would also be difficult to identify which muscle is the agonist in the torso, particularly so when not uh, in a medical or laboratory environment. Thank you. So th that was the question. Any any answers to anyone? Yeah, I think it will be it will be quite quite difficult also. And 
I think, uh, you know, if, if this is a patient with spinal cord injury, we have some evidence that this mechanism, at least the one we're testing here, is present in spinal cord injury, after spinal cord injury. So the persistent inward currents are, you know, upregulated and contribute to that. So if we are talking about the patient who has a spinal cord injury, and, and that is presented spasms in multiple muscle groups, but if you are thinking about another patient who have spasms for, you know, a completely different mechanism, I think, I think this is approach is a little bit different, okay? We are thinking here about suppressing activity and wanted activity that comes from receptors that becomes constitutively active and adapted after, the, after spinal cord injury. Yeah, thanks very much. So uh, any, any other uh, points on that question? Okay, thanks. Um, so the next question um, asks about the potential gender effects uh, in response to the vibration in humans with spinal cord injury. So uh, did, did you uh, check any uh, gender effect in responses or in the effect of vibration? Uh, I, I can uh, address that. Um, so uh, in, in spinal cord injury in general, there's, there's a, a, uh, a large disproportionate amount of injuries in men versus women. I think the, the statistic is about 85% of injuries are in men rather than women. Um, so we, we had a much smaller sample of women, so we weren't able to actually do a, a, any sort of statistical analysis based on sex. Um, but based on just trends in the data, there, there didn't appear to be any sort of difference based on sex uh, between the men and women that participated. Um, the, the, two, the two with the strongest suppression, one was a woman with a incomplete spinal cord injury and the other was a man with a complete spinal cord injury. So it, it doesn't seem to be, I, I don't think there's, there's any sort of uh, difference. Yeah, thanks Bradley. So that was a, a very good um, explanation. So we have uh, one other uh, question. So I, I read the question again. Um, we know that exposure to low frequencies can damage the nervous system in the long term. So um, for example, white finger syndrome for workers using power tools. Uh, do you think that there may be long term effects of exposure to vibration in spinal cord injured patients? Again, there, anyone? There, there is a review paper that actually uh, revised the possible contraindications of using whole body vibration, especially for a long period of time. And they suggested that some of the frequencies that are being used are not in agreement with what is recommended and could cause damage to people. And even in some cases actually can increase spasms or symptoms of spasticity. So, I think the, the problem right now, how I see it, is that we need a couple of more strict methodologies to quantify muscle spasms and to quantify the spasticity. So when you look at the effects in, and compare different papers, you can come to an agreement maybe in a little bit easier, easier way. So uh, it's, it's hard to say if, uh, in my view, if spasticity uh, is or spasms, they seem to be interfering at times with activities, but also they seem to help. But then if you look at the papers and how spasticity or spasms were assessed, this is binomial scales. So I think if we go back, we, there is a need to use a more strict methodologies to really understand if these methods are really having negative effects in people because the negative effects are being quantified by nominal scales, which are a little bit subjective. So, but there is a report uh, that suggests that these frequencies for a long time could be not beneficial for people with spinal cord injury. Yeah. Uh. Thanks, Monica. So that was a, a very thorough answer, actually. So um, I, I think uh, we don't have any. Oh, so we have another question uh, just uh, just arrived. So um, so it asks, um, 
Do you know which afferents the vibration primarily affects? I think you said it was not a cutaneous afferent, afferents. If so, can you differentiate between the targeting, uh, between targeting tendon organs or spindle activation? So some work by David Burke and uh, Roland colleagues uh, quite a while ago um, found that the vibration activates a lot of different uh, receptors, especially when you're vibrating over the skin. Um, so I don't think there's a way that for us to, to completely say that we're not activating other receptors. However, um, that work did find that, that certain frequencies uh, um, activate different receptors more preferentially. So, you know, the, the lower frequencies seem to be uh, more preferential towards activating the Golgi tendon organs, uh, whereas, you know, 80 hertz is, is kind of seems to be the optimal frequency to activate spindles. Um, and then when you get up to higher frequencies, you're activating pexidian corpuscles and other uh, cutaneous afferents. But I think that we're, we're likely activating everything to a certain extent. Um, it's just that, it, you know, if we're looking at the effects of reciprocal inhibition, um, you know, we're activating the 1As preferentially at 80 hertz. So that works in perfectly with our, our hypothesis that, that we're activating the, the 1A inhibitory system. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Bradley. So uh, that was, um, that was a thorough response. Um, so um, I think we don't have any other questions from the audience. So I have one uh, lasting question that I'm very uh, excited to, uh, to discuss um, as the, probably the last question. So we discussed um, uh, the, the, the motor systems, um, the, the, the motor circuits in the motor system uh, and then how we can prop them. But uh, what's, the more specific role of drugs and um, chemical agents, either in probing or targeting these uh, networks. So, um, and that's uh, not really specific to a spinal cord injury, but probably also applies to neurodegeneration, say ALS or other neurological conditions. So, um, so how, uh, so we can really best exploit um, drugs for identifying and targeting specific circuits. So probably, uh, I don't know, CJ uh, might want to um, discuss that more, but uh, it's really the last question for any comments you may have. Just briefly, I do think there's potential for drugs. Um, drugs that mimic serotonin and norepinephrine have a number of side effects because there are many, many effects elsewhere in the brain and potential effects in the brainstem. But still, uh, people take these kind of drugs all the time, Prozac, all these kinds of things. Uh, in, in the spinal cord, which you want to restore from the perspective of mono means, is that their uh, natural intact it, uh, projection is to inhibit the dorsal horn and, and sensory reprocessing of uh, the, the input that actually will trigger spasms and the ventral horn to promote motor output. And so uh, one of the hypotheses that Dave Bennett and colleagues have running is you, maybe you can stop spasms in the dorsal horn by using a 5-HT1 kind of receptor agonist. So I think there's a lot of potential for uh, thinking about increased specificity of drug actions. Yeah, thanks, CJ. So um, any other comments from the panelists? Uh, just one, though. Vibration or something physiologic like that is always better than drug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks very much. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess that what we're trying to do now, CJ, is to make the fact stronger. <laughs> because if you put our results ne next to David's results with the cyproheptadine, as you know, the long latency reflex is completely abolished by your medication. Also, that medication doesn't have approval, side effects, regulatory approval. So, but our effects are 20 to 30%, they're modest, but I think we are trying to enhance those effects by using more neurophysiology. Yeah. I, I think uh, if, we, if there's various mechanisms you can use to help restore the overall strength of reciprocal inhibition, 
some other <laughs> methods of training of plasticity or anything, all those things would be helpful. Yeah, thanks very much. So, uh, well, it is getting more and more interesting, but unfortunately, so we are all already five minutes over. So, um, so if there are no um, burning questions and no uh, other points, so I would like to uh, wrap up um, the meeting. So, um, once again, thanks everyone for attending. So, and especially the, the panel members for their valuable times. Um, so I know in, in, in the lockdown situation, it's very difficult to uh, find time and to coordinate uh, attending meetings. So thanks very much again. And um, for future events, um, uh, future journal clubs, so you can visit the um, society's website. And this is the information for, for the uh, upcoming journal club on 19th of August, for which you can register. And um, again, um, I would like to wish you all the best and um, success and thanks very much for attending. So um, goodbye everyone.